So, committee, we have um, some time here today with Legislative Council to look at the House version of cannabis for uh, consumer consumption and the Senate bill. So we've got Michelle Childs here to uh, walk us through a comparison of S-54 with uh, House Bill 196, which is currently across the hall. So Michelle, take it away. Good afternoon. So for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Council. And I also just wanted to mention I have with me Gordon Merrick sitting over here at Legislative Council desk. So Gordon is one of four law students who works in our legislative clinic. Uh, as interns during this session, and so you'll probably see a rotating cast of, of law students who might be subbing for me if I'm double booked or on some of the testimony because I'm trying to have somebody in here on all the S54 testimony. So I'll just sit over there. Um, so we have a chart here for S54 as passed by the Senate and H196 as introduced, and I. Um, tried to hit most of the substantive things. There might be little tiny language changes or things that are different in different in the two versions, but there is a lot that is that is very similar. Um, so we're going to start out looking at the Cannabis Control Board. Um, so both uh, both versions have three members. Um, the uh, they are appointed by the same um, folks. So you have one by the governor, one by the Senate Committee of Committees, one by the Speaker. Uh, in uh, S54, um, it specifies that the chair is appointed by the governor. And uh, what's different in the House bill is that the chair uh, is elected amongst them themselves rather than it being designated by, uh, by the governor. Um, in, the S in the Senate bill, there are specifics with regard to those particular positions. So, so you'll see that the governor appointee has to have a background in business management or regulatory compliance. The Senate appointee has a background in agriculture, horticulture, or plant science. And the member appointed by the speaker has to have a background in systemic social justice and equity issues. And there are no such requirements in the House proposal. Um, when it comes to salaries, um, the chair has a, in the Senate proposal, has a different salary than the other two members. So the chair uh, is at two thirds that of a Superior Court judge, which would put it at about 105,000. We talked a little bit about those numbers when Judge Fiscal was in here last week. And then for the other two members, it would be half that of a Superior Court judge at around 80,000. And in the House proposal, it's 60% of a Windsor County probate judge. And I'm sorry, I asked Stephanie for those numbers on Friday, and she sent them to me, and I forgot what it is. But um, I will let you know shortly. Um, so uh, with regard to the executive director, there's a specific requirement. This was uh, added in Senate appropriations that the executive director be an attorney with experience in legislative or regulatory matters. Um, I think you guys know the, the initial structure for the board is pretty lean at the beginning. It might be a little top heavy, but it's not. They, they do the recommendations for the build out for year two and three. They come back to you with recommendations in January of next year. And one of the things that Senate Appropriations was discussing is with did you need a general counsel to be assisting with all of the, the rules that have to be developed in that first that first year of the board, because remember, they have to adopt rules for the commercial system, for the medical system as it would operate under with the existence of a commercial system, and, and also for the dispensaries. And so they thought one way is to have the required the executive director to be an attorney who has experience in those matters that can be assisting the board with the rulemaking. So the salary is specified for the executive director in the Senate proposal at 106000 And the executive director, there's no requirements with regard to experience for the salary is not specified. So as I mentioned, in January of next year, the board is supposed to come back before the General Assembly. Um, one thing that is the same in both is that uh, they're going to come back to you with a recommendation for license fees. So that remember, there's no fees that are set in either bill, but they're going to come back to you and say, 
Well, for cultivator licenses, we recommend that there be 10 tiers, and here's the different types of tiering, and here's what those fee recommendations would be for an application, or for an annual license, or for a renewal license. And so that is the same in both proposals. Um, in the Senate bill, they're also going to come back to you in uh, next January with recommendations on resources necessary for implementation for the next fiscal year. So that was when they might come in and say, well, we're going to be processing applications in the fall of 2020. And to do that, we need an additional position that's going to be maybe doing, um, you know, processing those applications. Or maybe we're going to need a plant inspector or, or an enforcement person. Or maybe they're going to recommend that, you part, that they partner up with other agencies that might be doing similar tasks within those agencies. So it might be with Agency of Agri uh, Agriculture or with DF DOL. But they'll come back to you in January with those proposals. They're also going to come back on a proposal work with agencies to develop outreach training and employment programs, fo focusing on providing economic opportunities for individuals who have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Um, they're also going to come back on experience of other jurisdictions allowing retail cannabis deliveries. Um, delivery is not allowed in, um, in the Senate proposal. Um, they would allow it to continue to allow it for dispensaries, but not for retailers. Um, and then they're going to come back and recommend whether tax money should be allocated from the general fund to the cannabis regulation fund to cover costs of running programs. Questions so far, committee? Mm -hmm. Rob? Okay. What's the intent behind the delivery? Is, is there some security? Reason or around prohibition for delivery? Oh, or did you say it was prohibition for delivery, or that somebody there was a delivery aspect in one of around? These? Well, the the Senate bill does not allow commercial delivery. Oh, so right okay. now, medical dispensaries can deliver to patients. Um, that would continue under this, but it but it doesn't contemplate under the new commercial okay, so system that, that deliveries would be Sorry, allowed. That. However, most jurisdictions that have um, these types of programs do allow delivery, and so senators were like, we're not, we're not really sure how we feel about deliveries. Let's see maybe what the board might recommend about what's the experience in other jurisdictions around deliveries. What are things we need to think about? Do we want to allow commercial deliveries or not? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jim? So as I'm reading this, it, it really sounds like because nothing happens this year, and next year they come back with a whole series of recommendations. Yes, well, not to be argumentative, but I would no. say uh, stuff does happen this year in the sense that you have to kind of get this whole group up and operating and they have to initiate all of this rulemaking this fall. So they do have to start that work. Um, but because um, any way that you slice it with these programs, <laughs> Uh, and why it usually takes at least 24 months to go from date of enactment or passage of an initiative to having the first retail sales is you have to really adopt, go through the rulemaking process, which <coughs> say tends to be 10 to 12 months, and I don't think you can really cut it any shorter on something as complex as this with, with a lot of moving parts and a lot of people who want to be publicly involved in the rulemaking process. And so, um, so I think the idea was that because you're going you're gonna to have that year-long process of rulemaking, um, and which is going to take up a lot of time and effort and a lot of folks are probably going to be involved, is that the fees and things like that, which wouldn't kick in until the fall of 2020, that you can have, that it's more appropriate for them to come back with more detailed information for you on how to set fees or things like that. But I'm sorry, I didn't use it. No, 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 that this is helping. Um, I'm just trying to, I mean, we, last year we had a study commission working on this, and they came back with a bunch of recommendations, not mm -hmm. all. And I will certainly agree that they weren't working full time on it. These mm -hmm. are people with other lives to take care of. Um, but I'm just wondering if we're duplicating <coughs> some of that. By, but but right. then you've got, the rulemaking is obviously. I well, I would certainly expect that this board is going to look at the work of the commission mm -hmm. and the data that they put together, the the looking at the other. They're going to do a lot of that. They're going to yeah. use that. They're going to be working with a lot of the same people, and that's going to be, <coughs> I would imagine, a starting point for them about whether or not they think that they'll that, that works. 
Todd? Are there any other boards in the system that are this small that are projecting to have this much work to do? The um, having I don't know. Board. I would maybe, I, know, I could check with Betsy and see if her. Utility board. Um, it seems like you know, getting something up and running from the ground, one person goes out sick for a while, you're kind of stymied. I think there is a. No. I think there is a general acceptance. It's a. It's a heavy. It's a heavy lift for um, at, at the initial outset. And one of the things that the Senate proposal does is it says, um, and I think I have this later on, is it has uh, the auditor look at a few years out whether or not the existing the structure that's set up makes sense continuing out into the future, or should it be. Should it have a, a, a different structure to continue on as you start to build in and maybe add a, additional employees for doing enforcement, for doing plant health, for doing all these other things? Do you does it still work that you that makes sense to have a three member board with an executive director, and or should it be something different? Makes sense. All right. So for the Cannabis Regulation Fund, um, in the Senate proposal, uh, it's composed of all the fees, but just the fees. And, um, and there is no tax money in the Cannabis Regulation Fund. Um, so, uh, so it's all the fees, and it goes, uh, the monies from the fund go for implementation, administration, enforcement. Um, and then the difference is that in the, ta in the House proposal, uh, that fund also includes taxes. Jim? Where do the taxes go? They are all it's they all go into the fund as well as the fees and then the and then the monies are used for implementation, administration, enforcement of the programs. There's not a separate part at this point as for in introduction. And the, and the Senate bill. You said the Senate bill Oh the taxes go to the general fund. Okay. Uh, sales tax. The taxes go to the general fund. Right, I haven't gotten, do you want me to skip to the taxes, or? No, that's fine, we just, uh, we were looking at the taxes in the house proposal, and I was just trying to understand the difference. I mean, obviously there's a tax in there, so I was just wondering where it went. Right, let's skip, let's skip down to the end. Taxes, so in the Senate proposal, it's a 16% retail tax on cannabis and cannabis products, and that all goes to the general fund. There's no sales tax, there's no automatic 6% sales tax on that. There's a 2% local option. Um, in the House proposal, there's 11% retail tax on the cannabis and cannabis uh, products. And then there's the 6% sales tax, which now goes to the education fund. And then there's a 3% local option. So there's a smaller tax that goes into the cannabis, regu that, that goes into the cannabis regulation fund that is, than is the retail tax for the Senate proposal. Do I dare? <laughs> Just say the word, Jim. <laughs> okay, so on the House proposal, they have a, a traditional sales tax. Mm -hmm. And then a 3% local option tax. Mm -hmm. Does that take the place of, because usually when we have a sales tax, you got the 1% local option that's available to some communities. Right. This takes, my, my understanding is this takes the place, place of it, on. not in lieu of, or, or in addition. Correct. In. All right, thank you. Yep. And when you want to get into talking about the local option taxes, whatever you feel, we should have Anthea come in and talk about the taxes and specificity. Um, so the next difference is with regard to the temporary early sales to the public. So um, this is something that is not contained in the Senate in the Senate proposal, but is in the House bill. So. Um, because this is one of the, the really big differences in there, I don't know, do you want me just to talk to you just briefly conceptually, or I thought it might be helpful if you looked kind of at some of the language that's in the House bill, if that's, if you have the time, because I know you're hearing from the dispensaries later on in the week. Right, I um, think it would be helpful want... for us to, to see the bill language. Thank you. So if you, um, uh, I will pull, uh, I 
want to go to I want to go to H one ninety six I don't think you need to just for this, but you want one ninety six? Yes, one ninety six. No Thank side you. by side? No. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> So, um, so those of you following along on your hard copies, whatever, so page 13 of the bill is introduced. So temporary licenses for sales to the public. So we have currently, there are five registrations that have been issued in Vermont. Um, they are allowed to have um, basically two points of service to, to, to patients. So you could have a maximum of 10 out there, but you, you don't have 10 now. You just have five licenses and a couple have have the two locations. Um, the proposal in, in the House bill, um, and remember that this is currently regulated by the Department of Public Safety, um, is, is that uh, in, the House, in the House proposal would allow the anyone who has a, a valid registration for a medical dispensary um, to sell cannabis and cannabis products on a limited time basis, so only until July First of 2021, which is when essentially you would start, you would anticipate it have starting to have some of the retail commercials up starting to sell. And so they would have a period of a, a shortened period of where they would be able to sell uh, cannabis and cannabis products to the public. And when I say the public, I'm always talking about adults 21 years of age and older. I'm never talking about anybody under that. So no, nothing is ever contemplated under for under sales or possession. Um, uh, and so there you start out on subsection B with some intent language about the ability for them to sale under the, uh, to sell to the public under temporary license. Um, uh, line 11, dispensary <coughs> license for early sales should be required to meet the needs of its designated patients and caregivers during that time and shall not reduce access by patients and caregivers to products or services. Um, subsection C, so this is notwithstanding the, the existing chapter that regulates dispensaries and those rules. Um, a dispensary would uh, be able to apply to the Department of Public Safety for a temporary cannabis establishment license that would allow them to make those sales um, in accordance with provisions that are set forth here. So there would be an application period from August 1st of this year to October 1st of this year. They would submit a letter of intent to the Department of Public Safety um, of, that they would like to obtain a temporary license, um, letters to contain a detailed explanation of how the dispensary plans to implement the temporary program uh, while continuing to serve the needs of patients and caregivers, um, departments to work with the dispensary applicant on meeting the criteria and compliance with the provisions under the dispensary uh, rules now. Um, and then, then the department is to issue a temporary license no more than 60 days after the letter of intent is received by the department. Sales to the public can start January 1st of uh, next year. And then they expire, as I mentioned, July 1st for 2021. So it would be essentially an 18-month license. And remember, they're vertically integrated. <laughs> so they're doing everything from starting to grow to doing point of service. JP. Matt, when you say um, dispensary has the, uh, can get a temporary to start uh, selling, are you referring to a current, let's say, uh, this, this, this distribution point where people can pick up medical marijuana, or are you referring to a growth facility that, that doesn't sell in that site? So you're talking about like whether or not they could do service customers at the Milton facility as opposed to the Burlington point of service, exactly. right? Um, I don't think this is specifically addressed here. I think it's contemplated that it would be at where they're serving patients currently, but that may not be doable because of the particular location or wanting to preserve some confidentiality for patients or traffic flow or parking or things like that. So I think that's not really addressed in here. Okay. Marcia. So these are temporary licenses. Uh, what's the vision after this temporary license 
has expired, would the dispensaries continue, be able to continue to sell as part of the retail structure? If they wanted to do that, they would have to participate just like anybody else in applying for a license under the new system. So what they would do is if they obtained a temporary license, and let's say it's, um, it's uh, February of next year, and they have a temporary license, and they're doing temp and they're doing sales to the public, but they um, they anticipate that they want to continue doing that on the expiration of that. They will have had to have applied for whatever licenses they would need to. And remember, the commercial system is not automatically vertically integrated. So if they wanted to do something of all five of what they're doing in one registration for medical, they would have to apply for a cultivator, mm -hmm. a product, oh, you know, sense. every single one of those, they, and they would have to obtain those and go through the application process, pay those fees, and obtain those individual licenses and then get those approved in order to sell after after 20, July 1st, 2021. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see in subdivision two here on line 12, um, after they're approved for the temporary license, but before they begin operations, they should pay a one-time fee of $75,000. And that fee is deposited into the cannabis regulation fund. So it, right now, dispensary fees go into a marijuana regulation fund that's administered by the Department of Public Safety, that, and that, those funds are used to run that program. Um, it has run at a surplus for a number of years. Um, you know, JFO can probably come in and talk to you about how that's worked over the years. Last year, the legislature took $300,000 out of that fund and transferred it to general fund. Um, uh, so, but I do know that over the years, it has, it's composed of patient, patient annual fees and caregiver fees and the dispensary fees. And so that has been sustaining um, that fund, and so this new money would go into the new cannabis regulation fund um, to fund the work of the board in getting the program up and running prior to those new commercial fees coming in in the fall of 2020. So remember, is that you're going to have this board operating for over a year before any monies that are going to come into that fund to pay for the work of the fund. And we'll talk about a little bit later about how there's an appropriation in the bill for the, the board and the operation of the board, but it's spending in anticipation of receipts. Um, so $75,000 per, so if you had all five, um, uh, then that money in there. Um, subsection E, uh, these are the things they can do. They can cultivate, package, label, transport, and test cannabis, um, use cannabis and cannabis products to produce cannabis products and package label and testing them and sell them uh, to the public for consumption off the registered premises. Um, so subsection F is an exemption for the cultivation limits that are currently in Chapter 86 right now. Although there is a bill that passed the Senate that would do away with the cultivation limits for the medical programs right now, there is a the cultivation limits are tagged per patient. So um, under your current law for medical, patients can grow two mature and seven immature plants on their own. And so the way that it works for dispensaries is because patients have to designate one particular dispensary that is like their dispensary that they'll buy from, they're not allowed to go to all the dispensaries, is if a dispens dispensary knows how many patients has designated it as their dispensary, and then you take that number of patients and you multiply that times two to get your mature plants and multiply it by seven to get your immature plants. And so F is just saying that doesn't apply here because we're exempting out of that because we're going to allow them to grow to serve the public. John has a question. Um, so Michelle, the, the $75,000 fee for a temporary <laughs> license, can that be, I mean, that it seems like a lot for a temporary license. Is that amount of money going to be able to be applied to a regular license once the licensing fees are set up by the new Cannabis Control Board? I mean, do they, would they get a reduced fee for the new Yes, retail? exactly. No? Okay. Thank you. I think it's a special one-time offer. <laughs> um, the annual fee right now for a medical dispensary is $25,000. Okay. Um, 
you know, and this is obviously something that there's a lot of differing opinions and a lot of debate about whether or not to allow dispensaries to go first. And so I think the, um, the resident Young was trying to find the balance there and saying, um, trying to figure out where that sweet spot is to provide an incentive to get the early sales, to get the money coming into the fund, to fund the work of the board um, before there are, are sales under the new program. Um, so subsection uh, uh, G is a dispensary may sell only to the public on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and patients shall be entitled to make appointments on those days to avoid any significant wait times but are not required to make appointments. So under, um, so there was a concern about, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that the patients who are being provided these products and services now are not negatively impacted by this, dis by this dispensary starting to sell to the public. And something that we've seen in some other jurisdictions when you first open up a, a retail commercial market is um, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of people going, and uh, it can be long waits. Um, sometimes there are supply issues, so when, when Quebec brought online and Montreal opened its stores, it was only after a couple weeks they ran out of product. And so they shortened um, there, and I don't know if that's been lifted yet, but they moved to only uh, selling on, um, on a few days, so Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, so we were looking at that and saying, well, how do you, how do you kind of try to put in some some safeguards there to make sure that you don't um, negatively impact the, the medical program. So I understand that other jurisdictions where uh, medical dispensaries have started adult sale that essentially medical uh, patients cut the front of the line. Right, and that's one of the things here, which is that, um, you know, so like if you had, if, if, if on a day, the day that you had uh, retail, and you had a patient, they could make an appointment and say, I'm gonna come in at two o'clock and I wanna meet with somebody that they therefore, so there's a line out the door and cars down the street for the retail, but the patient gets served and doesn't have to deal with all of that. So H, so in a single transaction, a dispensary can provide a half an ounce of cannabis or the equivalent of cannabis products or a combination um, uh, upon showing a valid ID. I, I'm sorry, we were rudely interrupted by somebody saying happy birthday. I'll go festivity of the rest of the And no food's coming this way. Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> if he was here, he would be really bad. Um, uh, there's a provision here, see in H2, that cannabis and cannabis products sold to patients and caregivers should be priced at at least 10% below the same or similar products sold to the public. And then on I, the cannabis and cannabis products sold pursuant to section shall be subject to the tax provisions. And so, um, and so what will happen is that you will have the $75,000 fees going into the cannabis regulation fund, and as soon as they start selling, you will also have tax revenue going into that fund to be able to, to fund the, the work of the board before, again, you won't see any fees until the fall of, of 2020, other other fees from the commercial applications. JP? Is the amount of, of marijuana, cannabis, whatever, that a person can get on a medical, that's a, there's a limit on that, right? Yes, two ounces a month. Right. And <coughs> a person, uh, fulfill in their two ounce limit once more. <clears throat> now they go to a public a public store or a store where they buy a public how do they can they get a, can they get the the amount that the public can get on top of their medical? And if not, how do they how are they gonna track it? There's not provisions in here about tracking all of that. Um, I would say if somebody is in right now the the possession limit for um, an individual who's not a patient is an ounce. For a patient, it's two ounces. If they exceed that, they are in violation of the law, and it is a crime. 
Um, so, uh, but there's not, the, this, the language here doesn't contemplate or require uh, tracking with regard to the sales to make sure that someone does not exceed their personal limit. So if they decide that they want to uh, break the law and go over the limit, acquiring it, whether it's from a dispensary or their neighbor with a <coughs> wagon full of pumpkins and cannabis or however it is, that's there are provisions in law that uh, that 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 punch that. Okay, so currently they do not track, <clears throat> excuse me, currently they do not track the amount of marijuana that somebody would get on medical. Right now, for the medical program, you're required to designate one particular dispensary, and the dispensary has records of when they, what they have sold to you, and so they know how much they have sold to you in a month. Uh, my understanding from uh, from DPS is they are in the process of updating uh, software and have a new program coming online and uh, and that that will allow them the capability to do some more tracking if people are going in between dispensaries because again on S117 that has it passed the Senate uh, would allow a patient to go to any dispensary they wouldn't have to so if if, if they're usual dispensaries in Chittenden County, but there's a product that, that isn't carried by the dispensary in Chittenden County, but the Montpelier dispensary carries it, that they could they could go to either of those. And my understanding is that the new software will allow them to be able to, to track which one. And so I don't know what that means in terms of a commercial market, but I would imagine that's part of, um, when you look at the, what's required for rulemaking with regard to the board, um, things around record keeping and all of that kind of stuff is, is a part of that. And okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Nelson? That was going to be my question, how they're going to track because one person could go to one place and the next place and the next place. But it sounds like they're working on this method to track where people purchase stuff and who they are. Uh, I think that there is the capability for that, but you probably want to talk with, uh, with Jeff Wallen at BCIC about their software updates and what that means. Sure. So there's nothing in here that says that retail purchases have to be tracked, but they could, no. they could as part of the rules, potentially. No. They, they, um, talking about retail. <laughs> not, retail. Not no, there's special. nothing in here specifically with retail that says that the board has to develop some type of system for tracking, you know, if person A, bought how much they buy when they go. I don't know how they necessarily do that in other states or if they do that in other states. It, my mm -hmm. sense generally is that they don't track person to person. They regulate the businesses to make sure that the businesses are in compliance with the rules to make sure that your per transaction is within a certain limit that you're being you know you're carding people you're doing all of that but i don't think that the the other states um and you know we should find out i don't know definitively i don't think the other states go and say okay michelle childs you know can i track her specifically to see how many stores she's gone to or what she's done i don't think that we do that with regard to I mean, other than certain types of prescriptions with NPLEX, I don't think we do that with most things. No, no, I just <coughs> put it in me. A few years back, and, and I don't think Vermont's unique, but we passed legislation that if you go in and buy certain types of cold medicine. Now. Right, that's the NPLEX system, and we yeah. do have that for, for, uh, for those types of products, but that's right. a, a, yes. I just think we need to be careful about tracking individuals when they're still for prohibition for the purchase and sale of marijuana out there. Um, I think that's something we should hear testimony on if we're going to go down that path. But I think we need to be careful. But we're tracking it for uh, medical. Right, and, and the question that I have about that is I'm presuming that that limit of two ounces for a medical patient was put in to the original legislation because we were coming from a place of prohibition, universal prohibition, and that this was a small opening of people being able to have access to marijuana. 
I don't know if you were part of the development of the medical marijuana legislation way back when. Um, presumably, to correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. um, it was an effort to make sure that that you could differentiate between somebody who was who was possessing marijuana because they needed it for their own medical use versus somebody who was maybe dealing marijuana. Right. I mean, I think the originally when this came up conceptually, um, and Vermont did adopt their medical registry in 2004, so it's it's been a, a while, and um, you know. It was a very different landscape with regard to to cannabis. We were the ninth state to come online with a medical program, um, so still kind of early in the process. And Vermont was then and continues to be one of the more um, kind of tightly regulated programs um, compared to a lot of the others, a lot of a lot of the other states. And I think the concern was that we didn't want because it was at that time still a crime. We didn't decriminalize possession um, until 2013. Um, is that <coughs> we want people being able to buy an unlimited amount of cannabis and then potentially divert it. Um, now that everybody can possess an ounce plus their plants and anything that they harvest from their plants, question is whether in legal states in the area the question is whether or not somebody's going to go around to stores and buy a lot of cannabis and then divert it. I don't know that there's a lot of profit margin in that necessarily. If it's if it's as accessible. Right. Yeah. It's uh, helpful to understand that what we're looking at is transitioning away from a <coughs> prohibition model and into a retail market. And that's the best way. Yeah. So I'll go back. So that's, any more questions about the early sales? Well, at one point we were talking about trying to give the medical end of the spectrum, a leg up, to so to speak, to preserve its viability. And I haven't heard anything that really does that beyond early sales, but then that disappears when everything else comes online. Is that correct? Yes. So we're not really protecting our medical market then in either of these bills. I'm sure witnesses would have different different opinions on that. I, I don't know that. Um, there's nothing specific with regard to the direct protection of the medical program other than in in, um, in both bills in different ways. You know, the, the House bill that allows for the early, early sales talks about the value of the, well, actually both bills have it in the later provision, but the House bill talks about how important it is to preserve the medical program, and then when retail sales come on, you, they want to make sure that it's not negatively impacted. And um, you know, certainly having the dispensary be able to go first might be able to keep them yeah, I going. Know that I know that they're suffering some docking somebody seventy-five grand to sell for sixteen months. Is we will have the opportunity to explore that with some of the dispensaries. All right, sorry. I'm going to watch you do it oh, now. <laughs> so okay, so you want to go back to the other? Yes. So just pull this down. Oh, okay. And you're over there. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. You I get an extra stack. No, I'm embarrassed. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, okay, appropriation. Um, there is not an appropriation in the House bill. You know, it wasn't that they forgot, or they figured that's going to come as it percolates on its way through. Um, the appropriation in the Senate bill is eight hundred ten thousand uh, dollars. You heard from Joint Fiscal on Friday about that, so I won't spend much time. It's made in, in anticipation of receipts in the fund, and there is also a contingent provision in there that if at the end of FY 2022. If proceeds um, uh, from the, in, if there's a negative balance, it continues to run a negative balance based on the if these are already coming through and circling through, but it's still not enough to run the program. 
then whatever the deficit is in the fund money from the taxes would shift over and fill the hole in the fund. Um, there's also a number going back was the, the looking at the recommendation from the board about whether or not they're going to need some of that tax money to, or whether or not, you know, because the board will be coming to you with the recommendation for the fees, but they're trying to find that level, right? So you want one of the goals of, of both the legislation is to is to bring people from the illegal market into the regulated market. And so they want to find, you know, they want to have a lot of different layers and options for people to choose because they want to bring people in and encourage people to be in the regulated market. So you don't want to have fees that are so high that somebody that's currently participating in the illegal market is like, well, it's not worth my time. I don't want to comply with all this regulation. and I'm not going to do any better under this. And I'm going to pay all these fees. So I'm just going to stay doing what I'm doing. And so. Um, you know, maybe when they come th through with the fee recommendations, they say, well, here's what we think is reasonable, what makes sense, looking at other jurisdictions, what we think the market here is in Vermont. But even with these recommendations, we don't think that it will generate enough money from those fees to be able to bring us full on in FY 2021 or whatever for the staffing that we need in order to properly run the program. And so then they may come to you with that recommendation saying, and we think that, you know, a certain percentage of the money that comes through that goes to the general fund should be redirected back into the into the regulation fund. Um, so auditor of accounts, uh, this is I mentioned a little bit earlier, so this would have the auditor coming back to y'all in April of 2023 regarding the organizational structure of the board and whether it still makes sense now that everything's up and running and, and what it's looking like at the time. Curious time for them to report to us. Yeah, April is a bit, mm -hmm. a bit late for us to do anything. Yeah, I don't. You know, I honestly that I did not get that date. I don't remember why uh, that, but that was added by appropriations. So um, maybe they figure they'll be they'll have the budget in hand and they can figure out what they're gonna. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent point. That's curious. We might want to flag that as a um, question mark. So getting to the cannabis establishments and the regulation. So first, uh, so we'll talk about regulation by local government. Um, both have opt-out provisions. Um, so essentially, if a municipality does not want to have a cannabis a licensed cannabis establishment in the municipality, what they would do is they would put that before the voters. Either it could be, um, and we might. Um, want to tweak the language. I think when I was talking with the chair, we were thinking about to make it clear that it could be that because you could have the the fall uh, the fall presidential election. They could maybe put it on the ballot then in addition to like your town meeting election there or they could have a special election if they want to do that. So they would essentially put it on the ballot and put it to voters and say and they have the option of either saying they want to ban all cannabis establishments, so basically none of the five different types, or they could just say a particular one. They could say, we're okay with all of them, but we don't want a retailer. Or we know this nice little lady over there that makes creams and she wants to keep doing that and we let her, and so we'll ban all the rest, but we'll allow product manufacturers or whatever it is. So they can decide and then they put that before the voters. And then that's how they would prohibit a cannabis establishment within the municipality. Um, the, there's the ability under both proposals um, for uh, the select board to establish a cannabis control commission, similar to the way that they do for liquor control. Um, the, there's a small difference in that the, the way in the House bills it says that the that cannabis control commission shall be members of the municipal body and the Senate put in that it may be, so it doesn't require that it essentially be that body that's already together, so it could be somebody else that comes in there that's also, that would be on the commission. Um, and again, you know, the, the, there's not a lot of differences between the two, just a little kind of language differences here and there because they spent some time working on it, so that government operations spent some time. They didn't take jurisdiction of the bill, but they held some hearings and spent some time, and then they made recommendations to Senate Judiciary, and, and Senate Judiciary incorporated the recommendations of Senate GovOps into their amendment. Um, so the commission, the local commission can issue local permits and condition the permits on compliance with bylaws and ordinances. 
Um, it requires the board, meaning the Cannabis Control Board, to adopt rules relating to the municipality's issuance of local permits for a cannabis establishment and all applications for and forms for the licenses and permits has, are to be prescribed by the board, which is my understanding the way that they do for a liquor as well. Um, uh, there are, there's um, this last bullet here is kind of uh, belts and suspenders. Um, um, and so saying that it specifically prohibits a municipality from banning cannabis establishments through bylaws or ordinances. You already do that by saying you have to do the opt out by a vote, but there's specific language saying they can't do that. It prohibits the municipality from conditioning local permit on any basis not specified in the section. So this was the Senate was concerned about something uh, Massachusetts done with, does, which is uh, Massachusetts requires a cannabis establishment to have a, a host agreement with the municipality where it's located, and and they basically come up with a they negotiate a contract with that municipality, and they had received testimonies in the judiciary about I think Senator Sears mentioned it in here about certain things like. Okay, you're gonna. In order to get a permit from us, you're gonna make a twenty-five thousand dollar donation to the Boys and Girls Club, or you're gonna do this, or you're gonna do that. And the senators didn't like that, um, so they prohibited that. Um, but again, these are not things that you guys have granted to the power for municipalities to do anyway. But they wanted to be specific and, and very clear that these things were not allowed. On the opt-in, opt-out. So it looks like they're both opt-out. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any idea what other states have done? Uh, are they opt-in or opt-out? I think they're mostly opt-out, but um, I'll take a look if you have some and, and And on the opt-out <coughs> provision, um, you know, the Senate added, looks like quite a bit of, you know, Trump regards on, you know, what you can and can't do, but can you give me some examples of, like, say, for example, um, after a resale establishment, uh, was erected in your town. Um, you didn't realize how much traffic it was going to um, generate, mm -hmm. um, and you had some concerns about the traffic, and you needed to put up a light or whatever. Is that within a town's purview to say, "Look, we've got to make changes here, and you got to help pay for them," or is that not within their purview because they didn't uh, opt out before the retail? Mm -hmm. Well, the the state license is conditioned on you having the appropriate local permit. And I would say, and not, I don't mean to be coy yeah, yeah, about this, but not being the expert on what towns can do and require with regard to local permitting under their bylaws and ordinances. Once they have it. Once they have it. Um, I would say, you, I would imagine that your permits, your local permits are coming up for renewals on a, on a period, on some type of periodic basis. So when you're coming up for renewal of the license. Um, you know, I would say you probably want to talk with okay. the municipal yeah, folks. Yeah, I, I, I thought Senator Sears gave us permission to that, you know, once you were in, you're kind of grandfathered, but... Um. Well, you can't do, um, I'm sorry, if your question is, if you have, let's say you have a, uh, a, a retail establishment and you're mm -hmm. operating and you have chosen not to opt out, and then you say, mm, we don't like that, it's a mm -hmm. bad idea, we're now going to put it before voters and we're going to ban retail establishments that one would be grandfathered in. It doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want and not comply with whatever you're requiring for the for the conditions of their local permit or anything like that. But you can't, after the fact, after a business comes in and invests and sets up camp and gets all, as long as they are in compliance with everything, you can't then put a vote and kick them out. can you change any of your rules? Any yeah. of your rules. If, right. if, if, it's right. within, if, if it's within the municipality's authority, yes but you can't ban it through the vote once it's there. But you could ban any future ones from coming in. Yeah, no, no, I'm thinking of like your parking is not adequate, so we're gonna require. Isn't parking one of the things that they can regulate? Yeah, but can they do it after the fact, after mm -hmm. the vote? I would say that they could yeah. based on their local municipal authority for their permit. You can't after the fact. Well, okay. they, they, can't, they can't deny them the ability to operate under this, right. but they could. I would assume that they're, well, maybe Nelson has a thought on this. Being the zoning administrator of my town. Oh, it's, based, it's based on what the board that grants the permit puts on as conditions. Because mm -hmm. a local permit will allow them to have their business, and usually when they grant that business, 
they grant certain conditions on that business. And if they were saying parking was has the X or traffic control has the X, or if it went outside of that, then they would be breaking their permit mm -hmm. and they'd have to come back. But if it, as long as they were within it. But when they come up for, let's say, that's not in that, that A lot license. of towns do not have reviews of once they've issued the permit. They give them the permit for life. Is that, is that, uh, um, do they have to do that, or is it they don't do you have, have the to authority do to do an annual Currently, permit? Currently, we have a recycling facility that's going through a five-year review. It was a condition on the permit. All permits do not have that. It's based on the development review board to decide how that permit should be handled in the future. I mean, it seems as though I, that you would have, when you're issuing these local permits, you'd say, here's what we think, you know, here's what you're going to do, but that you have periodic review to make sure that everything's working. And then when you have your review, you say, well, now, actually, you need to accommodate more parking because it's affecting your neighbors. And that's a condition of renewal of your, of your local permit. And then the state permit is conditioned that you're in compliance with your local permit. Um, okay. <laughs> really <laughs> um, right, okay, so that's what we have on the list for rulemaking. Um, uh, substantially the same, little t language tweaks, things we've done here and there. I just kind of hit the highlights around kind of some of the differences. So one thing that the Senate has that the House bill does not have is the board has to adopt policies and procedures for conducting outreach and promoting participation in the market by diverse groups of individuals who have been harmed by cannabis prohibition that's not in the House bill. Um, Senate bill has specific limitations on the amount of THC that are in the products. Um, there are limitations we're talking about the board has to adopt those but they're not it's not as it doesn't set the uh, the 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 limit, which is, they, there is a limit set in the Senate proposal. Um, Senate proposal uh, um, has just a little bit of a language difference around prohibition on products or packaging designed to make the product more appealing to persons under 21. And so they just added it that it's the not just the products, but the packaging being designed to be appealing. So just again, kind of just a little finessing there. I also mentioned to you is that um, both bills as introduced talked about, it talks about children oftentimes or minors, and the Senate changed almost all of that to persons under 21, um, since that is the legal age of possession in Vermont. Um, and then also in the Senate proposal, there's a requirement that a, if a retailer is going to sell both cannabis products and hemp products, so you, know, you see all the CBD stuff that's being sold in different places, that that be clearly identified in the retail uh, in the retail store about what is what is a hemp product, a hemp derived product, and what is a cannabis derived product. So with regard to criminal history records, um, again, very similar, just a little bit of a language tweak in the Senate version. So right now, um, so recall, remember that anybody that's going to be associated with a cannabis establishment, whether it's going to be the applicants and the owners, it's going to be the financiers, it's going to be the employees who are working there, that they have to have a criminal history record check. And so that's a, that's a Vermont check records. It's also a fingerprint supported FBI record check. Um, and, uh, and so that's done in both proposals. Um, but in the, um, and then the board is gonna adopt rules for basically determining whether or not if somebody comes back with a criminal history record, what would be a disqualifying criminal history record? And states do it differently. Some states do a point system. Some you know, fall into certain categories. But it leaves it to the board to come up with that system. And uh, to see the, the highlighted language there, the Senate added that, um, uh, that the board in the development of the rules is to consider the record based on factors that demonstrate whether the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of the regulated market. And you'll see there is the last sentence in both of them is that nonviolent drug offenses shall not automatically disqualify a candidate. If, uh, if, if a member of a diverse group that had experienced discrimination in the past, and if they're going through this process, they're experiencing it again, what's their recourse? 
I'm sorry, experiencing. Um, well, if if the, when you're talking about groups that were um, harmed by the by prohibition, prohibition. Mm -hmm. I think at root it's it's discriminatory because of their color of their skin mm -hmm. or what have you. But if they're going through this process and they feel that they're being you mean with regard to the review of the criminal history record or me the process in general the process in general uh what would be their recourse you mean as in like they're filing to be an applicant to receive and a they license, feel that they're being or if they're not being um equitably you know considered <laughs> what, 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 what would they do what could they do i don't know i have to think about that because it's more than likely <laughs> could be the case. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder. Right. Um, so for public records, uh, very similar, just a little bit of language differentiation. Um, so in the Senate proposal, um, so the following records are exempt from public inspection and copying, and this just breaks it out to make it clear that it's um, any records um, in either an application or once somebody's been granted a license, and we didn't make that distinction in the in the House bill because I think we just hadn't thought of that distinction yet. Um, so it's any records relating to security, public safety, transportation, or trade secrets, and then also employees added for once you have a licensee. So I think most of those kind of reasons are kind of obvious. So you know, one of an example would be that. When an applicant is applying for a license, one of the things they have to submit is a is a site plan, and you know your plan for security, and you know and your plan for moving money, and all of those things, and you probably um, don't necessarily want those things to be to be public. Um, so priorities. Uh, so both uh, both bills have a a uh, statutory list of priorities. There are uh, really uh, not many uh, requirements for applicants in terms of like getting in the door to be an applicant. You have to be 21 and you have to submit to having your criminal history record check done. Um, but there are a list of priorities um, for the board to consider and they're to adopt rules um, that uh, don't, this, this list isn't exclusive, but um, uh, the, both of those provide a list of things that were important to them for the board to consider. Um, so the first being whether the applicants um, are residents of Vermont. Um, so I will say uh, that in past proposals, there have been requirements that applicants be residents of Vermont. So this is a shift. The Governor's Commission uh, made the recommendation that it be a preference for Vermonters rather than a requirement for Vermonters to, um, to allow you know folks to be able to partner up with folks who may have expertise in other markets. Um, you know, I think, uh, we haven't discussed it much this year, but we have in past years, earlier years, about whether or not you can just say, you know, Vermonters and a preference for Vermonters. And I think, um, you know, in any other context, you would be saying it's protectionist and couldn't do it, but we're talking about a federally illegal substance. And I think there are arguments on both sides as to whether or not you can provide a preference for residents. Um, my recollection is that most states with a legal commercial market do have residency requirements. That's not just preferences, but they require people to be residents of that state in order to be applicants. So I don't think you're going too far out on a limb with regard to the, the way that other jurisdictions are doing. Um, second one is whether applicants have an existing medical cannabis dispensary license. So here's one where there is a little bit of a, of a leg up for existing dispensaries. So that would be, um, you know, as long as they're in good standing with their registration for the medical dispensary, that would they would get some extra points there with regard to their application. Uh, whether the applicants would foster social justice and equity in the cannabis industry by being minority or women-owned business. Whether the applicants propose specific plans to recruit, hire, and implement a development ladder for minorities, women, and individuals who have historically been impacted by the cannabis prohibition. Whether applicants propose specific plans to pay employees a livable wage and offer benefits to those employees. Whether the project incorporates principles of environmental sustainability, including energy efficiency. And then the geographic distribution of establishments based on population and market needs. So that's something that exists with regard to the dispensaries now is that if you've got five licenses, you don't put them all in 
Jenna County, you know, I mean, maybe they based on the population or the patient size, but generally they're supposed to be distributed to, in order to serve the, mar the market needs. So they're to consider that as a factor. So if you have, everybody's applying for Jenna County and nobody in other ways, then they're supposed to consider that. And that would also help protect medical marijuana dispensaries, perhaps, because they're already located in certain areas. So they are. They are. They are fanned out. Across the so if they apply for retail licenses, then that would have to be taken into consideration in granting other. Right. Although they would not have to have their retail and, med and medical dispensaries co-located, they could have a separate um, uh, point of service for, uh, for 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 serving the public versus serving patients. Because um, I know that some of the, when I think of one in particular, you know. The, the place where they serve patients is quite small, and it, by not be amenable to having a long line or a lot of cars coming or that sort of sort of thing, and so it may be that they want to keep that that uh, pay location for serving patients somewhere, and then have a different location for serving potentially a much larger group of folks. Um, and that's not re and, and there is language in both bills that says that that requires the board to adopt the rules around how to address that particular situation if you have a dispensary that also has a retail one and that if they're going to co-locate how should they uh, how should they address that situation to ensure that patients do have um, maybe some a little bit of confidentiality and access to the to the same services and and the counseling that they get now that isn't going to kind of be overtaken by the commercial market and that's all I got. And then we're back to taxes. Back to taxes. We talked about. Um, committee, any other questions for Michelle with respect to differences between the House introduced version and the Senate passed version? Um, as far as taxes, is there any discussion about dedicated funds for public education surrounding? Uh, cannabis use or, or rehabilitation programs. I see some money dedicated to the education fund for this. That's it. Right. Well, there's not, that's just in the House version, right, with the sales tax. You're talking about, was there talk in the Senate bill around dedicated funds? Mm -hmm. um, there was the, the, um, the senators who put forth this proposal and which had passed was that um, while they, they certainly recognize those needs and um, is that they thought that what was appropriate is for that tax money to go into the general fund and for them to be making those decisions the way that they make all their decisions about whether or not to dedicate money to those things rather than have it specifically tagged for certain programs which is the way that you know previous bills on this had always kind of said a certain amount is going to go here or here's the priorities you do that but so rather than have dedicated funds as they said let's do it like we do everything the money will go in we'll know how much money is coming in and then we can make a decision about funding those those projects thank you yeah. any other questions on the comparison between the two bills excellent thank you for being with us this sure morning. thanks for having me I'll see you again soon okay so we are going to shift gears now and uh, take up S107. That's the end. Welcome. We, uh, we need a little introduction to S107. That's good. For the back record, that's Ann Rask, Legislative Council. Let's see. <clears throat> Kelly has posted for you this overview here of S107 as past the Senate. Let's take a second to pull up. We can use this as well as the bill itself as we go through, but first this document provides just a general summary of what S-107 would do. S-107 is called an act relating to elections corrections, and this general summary uh, lists the topics that this covers. So big picture, 
as you'll see throughout this bill, <coughs> there is um, use of the gender neutral term voter instead of free men and free women, which appears still in a few places throughout Title 17, our elections title. It also covers using DMV data for voter checklist maintenance purposes. It addresses major political party organization, as well as candidate primary petitions and statements of nomination. What happens in the case of primary recount ties? It also allows for the electronic delivery of early voter absentee ballots for voters who are ill, injured, or have a disability. It would allow um, the use of vote tabulators during early voting in the town clerk's <coughs> office. It also addresses standards for defective ballots and retention time for unused ballots and the date of a special election to fill a congressional vacancy and campaign finance reporting date. So big picture, those are the topics. So we can just throw this against the wall like I practiced. So I was going to press Representative Harrison. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then this summary provides a section by section summary. We can look at both the bill itself and this summary as we go along. So you'll see that this bill covers a lot of different topics, and each of the topics are set off by those three asterisks on each side of the topic. So first you'll see it deals with this chapter in regard to ratifying Articles of Amendment to the Vermont Constitution. And this is a whole chapter in our Title 17. And throughout this Section 1, and throughout the whole bill itself, um, the bill would substitute the, that gender neutral term voters for the phrase free men and free women that's still used in some places. And as we have talked about before in this committee, um, the Supreme Court justices made that same change to our Vermont Constitution except for that one place above the qualifications for free men and free women. But otherwise, our Constitution uses that term voters. And because free men and free women was used in a few places still in T17, this would just use that gender neutral general phrase, voters, um, as it's used elsewhere in Title 17. So that's what you'll see is going on here in this section 1842 and 1843. <clears throat> um, you'll see a lot of cleanup happening in this bill too. So you'll see here in this section 1843, the summary notes, um, this cleanup here in subsection C is just substituting the language that polls open at a certain time instead of ballot boxes um, open at a certain time. And uh, it's just making a cross reference to <coughs> Uh, the section that currently exists about what time our polls have to open. So that's a cleanup change. And you'll see a lot of cleanup language throughout this bill. <clears throat> you also see breaking up subdivisions and subsections takes up a lot of space in the bill, but that's what's happening in a lot of places. There's just another uh, change to use the term voters. Uh, section 1845 talks about who gets to vote on proposed amendments to the Vermont Constitution. And <clears throat> our statute already provides that it's the voters at a general election that vote on proposed amendments to the Vermont Constitution. So this is just cleaning up this language here, Section 1845, to eliminate unnecessary language, to just be more concise in saying that the elections provisions relating to the vote to ratify an amendment are the same as those in the general election. I'm just getting rid of unnecessary language instead. Um, you also see what I've done in this summary is to highlight in some uh, bold italicized text some potential revisions um, as I've gone through the bill. And here's one here. In this section 1845, it just seems that um, now that this language, the unnecessary language, would be removed, you can potentially uh, revise the title of this section because now you'd be getting rid of reference to checklists, booths, and clerks. Um, and so a uh, proposed amendment or a potential amendment you can do is just to revise the section heading to have it be conduct of election or something similar. I just missed that on the Senate side, but found it on this side. This goes to show we do better work on this side. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just some more cleanup here, voters, and here this is about posting of checklists and just it's the same as what's already provided in this other section, so the cross-reference is just updated. Um, 
and so just cleaning up unnecessary language, more voters changes. The section 1849 is interesting because right now the statute provides that the governor to issue a proclamation um, after it's been ratified and it refers to um, that once an amendment has been ratified it would require all magistrates and officers and all citizens of the state to take notice thereof and govern themselves accordingly. Well, this reference to magistrates is proposed to be struck since now. We only have magistrates in the family division of the Superior Court. That's it. Um, and so the reference to them just seems to be outdated and they could be included within the general term officers. And here in Section 1850, um, this is in regard to the requirement for uh, the Secretary of State to send the ratification chapter to town clerks, and this is just providing when the Secretary of State would need to do it. Um, and here the suggestion is the uh, Secretary would need to send it out at least two months before the vote on the ratification. All right, they're moving into Section 2 in regard to reapportionment, and these are technical corrections. Um, here, in, on page 6 in sub B, there's an elimination of language that refers to senators as county officers because they're not technically county officers. And in section 3, um, you've already made the same change in your S-11 bill that the Senate subject to reapportionment, they are, by the Constitution. This just clarifying language to add reference to them. So you'd have two bills, if this were to pass as is, you'd have two bills saying the same thing, but it's drafted the same way. Uh, section 4 is just using that uh, voter's term again and just substituting chapter for title, which you'll see throughout as well um, when you're referring to a specific chapter. Sections 5 and 6 get into voter registration. Here in Section 5, it would explicitly provide that the Department of Motor Vehicles would be required to share its motor vehicle driver's license, driver, driver privilege card, and non-driver ID card customer data with the Secretary of State's office for the Secretary's use in conducting voter registration and voter checklist maintenance activities. Um, and Madam Chair, I'm happy, if anybody can interrupt me as they want, and I know the Director of Elections is here too, however you want to run it, if you want to have um, the Director chime in as we go along, or whatever is good for you. Thank you. Jim, you have a question? So this section here, I mean, we already get, I assume, Elections already gets information from DMV because unless you opt out, you get registered to vote that way, or you can get registered to vote, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would this just expand it so that uh, addresses could be updated? This might be a time to refer to the director about the secretary's intent on using this language. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. Well, signing director of elections for the record. Rep. Harrison, good question. We get two files from the DMV on a daily basis. The first is everybody who didn't opt out and who has said, send my information to the Secretary of State. That covers new registrations and change of address, both. Okay. The other file we get from DMV is actually, we already get the file that's being described in this section, which I like to call their underlying customer file. That's all their applicants for the things listed there, driver's license, privilege card, non-driver ID. We already get that file. That's their big baseline file, essentially, everybody who has come through the DMV. We use that file right now for the limited purpose of um, verifying driver's license numbers that are given to us, say, on a paper form. Somebody applies at the town clerk's office and says, here's my six-digit driver's license number. To walk back a little bit under the MVRA, the National Voter Registration Act, DMV is required to give us that file for that purpose to match driver's license numbers that are provided to us on applications. But that's a, that's a pretty simple use of that file, right? It's a yes or no, and then we look into it if, if it's a no. <clears throat> what we've asked the DMV to do is to let us use that file for an additional purpose, which is essentially um, sharing it with other states for comparison against their DMV files and voter checklists to primarily identify people who've moved out of state in Vermont and the dual purpose, that's sort of the list maintenance side of things, which is the second of two references. 
voter registration and voter checklist maintenance activities. Maintenance is compare it to other DMVs across the country and tell me if you have a more recent DMV record for a person who's on my checklist so that they can be asked whether they still live in Vermont or not. It also will be used through that same service to do a one-time outreach to people that they can identify using that file as eligible but unregistered. It was, it's that one piece of outreach that's part of what we want to do with this file that for those of you who weren't around last year and seeing some of the history of this that DMV was concerned about and they essentially asked me to author some language to this effect which says that we can use it as a clear message from the legislature that we can use it for these two purposes. And so I think the most important thing for the committee to know is after about a year of working with them, both DMV and the governor's office have reviewed and are on board with this language to let our office go forward with this sort of nationwide system of comparing voter checklists and DMV records. So just, I want to just make sure I understand. So yeah. right now, look, I just got a renewal registration for uh, car. Yep. If I had an address change and I change it up, would you get notification of that? If you don't check the box that says don't send this to the Secretary of State, then yes. Is there a box on there? Yes. And I know on the license there is, but there is on the... Yes. Oh, okay. So if I don't check it, you will get it? Yes. And, they, and you hopefully that helps you keep up with address. That's been really, really good for us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this will help you on the... So if I moved out of state, I assume when I registered in another state, they would send something back to Vermont, and then Vermont would take me off. Mm -hmm. The clerk is meant to. It doesn't always happen, as you might imagine. Right. This will also help picking up people who have moved out of state, but may not have even registered to vote, but have gotten the driver's license in another state. Okay. So, just I want to. Sorry if I'm being slow here. Yeah. Um, it, it's been suggested that um, a number of people who do not live in Vermont, are not residents of Vermont, register their car in Vermont because the car, the auto insurance is cheaper. They have a second home here. How does this all play? If that person is currently registered in another state and does what you're talking about, right? Gets a license or registered registration. I'm not that, yeah, that 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 registration. The license might be a little different. No effect. It won't have any effect. We don't get registration information under this language or otherwise. Okay. These are only people who apply for licenses or privilege cards. Okay. Nelson. If I heard that correctly, then if I had a home in Florida, I could have a car here registered in Vermont, even though it's a second home. And yeah, I can have my regular one registered in Florida without you knowing either one of those? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. That's for DMV. But I think that's but, the case. But, but you said earlier you don't you would get the information if on my motor vehicle registration I change addresses. If you check. You check. I should have been clearer then if you were talking about a change of address on your registration for my your vehicle. For my vehicle. That's different. I'm not going to that. You won't get that. So it's just a driver's license. I thought you were renewing your driver's license. Right. Just license. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the I just needed to clarify that because I knew that wasn't true. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Y'all were probably looking at the bus. What uh, Jim was asking, answer some of the questions, but so so if you renew your driver's license, let's give you a scenario. A guy from Burlington moves to Bennington. Doesn't notify Burlington about he's moved, and a year and a half later he renews his license. So the re your D Vermont DMV renewal application comes through, and, and somehow you, you notify the post office for your mail, so it goes there. So anyway, you have now officially notified DMV that you're not living in Burlington, uh, Bennington, and you check off, or is there a check on a license renewal as well as an initial license? Yes. Okay. So you check off the you, yes, you can send this to the Secretary of State. Your office then gets that information. How does the city of Burlington find out? Because the guy that went to Bennington don't care, he's not gonna notify anybody, he don't care. I'm just making a scenario. Mm -hmm. How does Burlington now know that this gentleman that moved to 
uh, got into the router board, whatever I said, doesn't, doesn't live there anymore, so they can take him off the Burlington checklist. Is there somehow, is there something generated to Burlington? <clears throat> Excuse me, there is. Through your office? Yes, through our election management system. Okay. Um, which farms those out to the appropriate clerks. What would happen in your scenario is the Bennington clerk would get a notice of a DMV generated application to be added to the Bennington checklist. <clears throat> Okay. And when he or she approves that, oh, this goes to Burlington. Instantaneous. Oh, so I mean, John. Good, good. That's recent, sir. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. good. That happens. Keeps the voter checklist updated and current. Thank you very much. Can I see another question over here? Okay. Moving on to section six. Oh, excuse me. Jim has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, this is for Will again. And so I'm, I'm reading back. We, um, if someone was not a U.S. citizen, we did something to give them a driver's license. Yes. Uh, would you get that as well? We get that information in this big file, and we already do. And how do you separate that out? <coughs> we don't. So they get registered to vote? No. Okay. It comes in the big file, not in the, the big file. Might have that is not, to I described right at the beginning, we get two files. One is everybody who didn't opt out and is qualified to vote. That's the only file that's ever used to update voter records, add people to any list, remove people from any list. And we get the underlying file that is for use solely of verifying driver's license numbers. So even if that includes these non citizen driver ID numbers, they just essentially don't ever get looked at. Because they're not on your other They're not flying and being cross referenced with the Thank you. Yeah. So there was a section in the original S107 that the Senate committee chose to, to remove because they hadn't had time to kind of jump through all the hoops. Would this be a good time to talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, we can talk about S107 as introduced. Um, that would have allowed um, automatic voter registration at what are called voter registration agencies. It's in the 2100s. Here is the language. This language no longer appears in the bill. But as introduced, this language would have allowed the Secretary of State to designate voter registration agencies that provide qualified applicants with state services or also can provide services to inmates in the custody of EOC with automatic voter registration on the application forms that those agencies use. Let me just um, define for you a voter registration agency. It's a defined term. I can just pull it up real quick in the statute so you can all see what I'm talking about. Voter registration agency is defined in our Title 17 election definitions that apply to all of the Title 17 unless a chapter provides otherwise. 17 BSA 2103. A voter registration agency is defined as all state offices that provide public assistance, all state offices that provide state-funded programs primarily engaged in providing services to people with disabilities, any federal or non-governmental offices that have agreed to be designated as a voter registration agency, and any state or local agency designated by the secretary as a voter registration agency. And those can include Department of Taxes and Labor and offices that provide services to people with disabilities um, other than those with state-funded services. And so this language, and the bill is introduced, would have allowed the Secretary of State to designate certain of those voter registration agencies so that those agencies would provide automatic voter registration as part of the app as part in the applications that they have for people who apply for the benefits at that agency. 
And so you know, what we have now for automatic voter registration is um, when you go to the DMV, you actually you have to opt out if you don't want your DMV registration application um, to also serve as an application to register to vote. It's an opt out now. So this would apply the same principle to voter registration agencies. It would allow the Secretary of State to designate which ones would include automatic voter registration on their application forms. The idea being when people apply for that agency services, they would also need to opt out or otherwise their application form would be considered an application to register to vote. The language provides that prior to making any designation, the secretary would need to consult with the secretary or the commissioner of the agency to determine the feasibility of how well it would fit in with the services that they provide. Um, there's additional language. I won't go into all of the details, um, but it essentially allows the secretary to designate which agencies would serve um, as automatic voter registration agencies. This language was removed, though, um, from the bill. And I can tell you part of the discussion in committee, in public committee discussion, was part of the concern going to the citizenship issue that we were talking about. Because to register to vote for all of our elections now, you must be a US citizen. Um, so ultimately, there was some uh, discomfort with the idea of requiring people who are applying for these agencies' benefits to also um, reveal their citizenship status, big picture is uh, why there is a committee discussion as to why that was removed from the bill. Jim? I'm going back to the statute. It sounds like we already have a lot of some of this. For Am I reading it wrong? DMV, your automatic voter registration at, your, at DMV. Okay. And this would expand it to other voter okay. registration agencies. Uh, a little bit. I would love for you to do that. Thank you. Um, the way I will describe this provision, Betsy did a great job. We did, we did automatic voter registration two years ago. It went into effect in 2017 at the DMV. You guys did a lot of hard work on that and understanding what it meant. Um, automatic voter registration in general has been a very effective policy across the country in very broad terms. Um, it's, it's been a real sort of bipartisan policy success, is the way I would describe it, enacted in red and blue states across the country. It's primarily limited to DMVs like it is here in Vermont. I forget where I saw this interesting chart that I was looking at the other day, though, which did identify about five or six states that already have a provision like this on the books, too, that allows, and that's why I'm fully supportive of this provision, is how sort of permissively it's written. And it was written with an understanding of the practical difficulties of implementing this at some of these social service agencies. And if it hadn't have been written in a way that acknowledged those difficulties, I wouldn't support it. If it was mandating us to implement automatic voter registration at any of these agencies, I wouldn't be supporting it now, because I don't know enough about whether they're ready to do so or not. So the way this language is written is it says the secretary shall explore this essentially with these other agencies. And it is, as Betsy described, at baseline, the, the, the approach change is to say you have to, from taking an action, from saying, like, yes, I want to register while I'm applying for these benefits, it's an opt-out method where you would have to take an action to say, I don't want to. All these agencies are already doing voter registration when their applicants come in, but the basic method at them is at some point in the application process to say, would you like to register to vote? And, and at these, even unlike DMV, even back when DMV was on paper, they typically just hand you a, a voter registration application and then on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, we have, we have a folder full of these from the Department of Health and these various agencies across the state. So to get to an opt-out method where you're not, you don't have to do sort of an active other question, the way that AVR works is you have to look at the agency's current application, like we did with DMV, and say, are they collecting all the information we need to collect to do, to determine eligibility to vote, as Betsy Ann said, the, the key one there, the critical one is always citizenship. And AVR and voter registration in general from these agencies works much better and much more efficiently if you can transfer the data electronically rather than paper forms, which we're also doing with DMV. 
that gets you into the question of whether that agency keys or stores that citizenship data off of the paper form. That's what became the difficult rub with DMV, was they actually collected it on the paper form when we were asking to go to electronic transfer, they weren't currently even keying it into their database. So those two reasons, whether they're collecting citizenship and whether we could get to a place where we do an electronic transfer of the data would be the main two things I'd be looking at with these agencies before going forward. The bill requires us to list once a year any that we've designated to go to ABR, um, but certainly allows for, in my reading of it, for us to say we haven't designated any this year um, in Phillips View. And so for all those reasons, I was supportive of it. My impression was that the Senate GovOps Committee didn't fully understand it. I didn't have a chance to do what I just did and kind of explain it in detail for them. Questions for Will? It's a good example of where a, a, a advocacy group brought a policy idea to us, but then said, how can we do it in a reasonable way that makes sense? And this is what All right. We are back to the bill as passed Senate, and we're on section six. And as your summary indicates, all that's going on here is just breaking up a subsection that has been irking me because it's so darn long. It goes on for pages, and I, it's just breaking it up into subdivisions. So. All of this language is just providing subdivisions to make it easier to read and understand. So that takes us through a bunch of different pages, all the way to page 13 into section seven. And this part of the bill gets to changes in regard to political party organization. Um, it's my understanding the Secretary of State's office consulted with parties as um, these updates were uh, being considered. Um, and this is the final result um, after the Senate had reviewed it. Um, so many of the proposed amendments overall <coughs> loosen the restrictions on what statute requires for major political parties to organize. So here your summary indicates aside from stylistic changes, um, you can see that the first uh, substantive change is in section 2303. Um, this is about the town committees and specifically in 2303B2, there's a special notice that's required right now um, for town committee meetings. And right now it says if your town has 3,000 or more population, you have to provide this special notice. First thing it would do is it say, okay, for larger towns, 5,000 or more population, you have to provide a special notice. And here the authorization would be to say that this notice could still be in a newspaper or under current law could still be in a nonpartisan electronic news media website, but here the proposal is to say, or an online forum that specializes in the news of the state and the community. Marsha has a question. So is that saying, Betsy, that, um, that anyone who has a town population of less than 5,000 no longer has to post that? Those are just provided in B1, um, just saying at least for those smaller towns, um, it's just posting a notice um, in at least in the town clerk's office and at least one other public place in the town. So everybody has to do that. Okay. But if you're a larger town, you also have to publish a special notice. We've just got some more breaking up of subsections, 2304. And 2305. Here in 2306, what's going on? You can see section. The section right now just says that uh, town committees have to perform some things in the manner above. And in statute, we like to specifically say where in statute are you saying that? So this would just name the specific statutes that it's referencing in this chapter. And just some cleanup language. Uh, here. In 2307, it's requiring a town committee to submit to the county and state committees information regarding town committee members and also a requirement to provide phone and email contact info. Big picture what's going on now is that town committees have to provide this info not only to the chairs of the state and county committees but also the Secretary of State's office. 
So the Secretary of State's office is getting all the party town committee's organization papers. And so this would eliminate that um, for the, from the town and county committees and just say, instead, don't give it to the Secretary of State's office. Just provide all your membership info to the Secretary, or excuse me, to your state and county committee. And then what you'll see at the end of this chapter is that finally the state committee submits its certification of organization to the Secretary of State's office, lists the town and county committees that have been organized, and then they're considered certified so that the Secretary of State's office is not collecting all these uh, organization papers from town and county committees. 